Okay. Our next speaker who will speak on identification is Miriam Hibble. Ms. Hibble was the Director of Law at the Brooklyn Defender Services for 15 years. Prior to that, she was Senior Supervising Attorney at the Criminal Appeals Bureau of the Legal Aid Society and taught appellate advocacy here at Brooklyn Law School. Ms. Hibble is the author of New York Identification Law, the leading treatise in New York on the subject of identification. Ms. Hibble. Because I care so much, I came out of retirement and I'm fresh off surgery and nothing that overdosing on Percocet won't cure. Um, yeah, I have some spare, but let's, let's not talk about that. Okay, so um, it's rather unusual for me to be giving a lecture on legislation in the area of identification because I think in the many years now, possibly even many decades, that I've given this annual update on ID, it's almost always been case law. But um, as you know, there's been a significant development in legislation, but I would like to just briefly address one case that's kind of a sleeper case decided by the Court of Appeals, but I think it's relevant in the area of identification, and that's the case of People versus Perkins, in which the issue was how relevant is the um, witness's inclusion or omission of a particular feature in giving a description of the perpetrator to the weight of that feature in the lineup or photo array. And um, that will make sense if, you, if I give you the facts. In Perkins, there were four victims to a crime and they all identified the defendant in a photo array in which every photo depicted someone with dreadlocks, including the photo of the defendant. Several weeks later, all four victims then viewed one lineup in which the defendant was the only one who had dreadlocks, which were deemed visible despite the police having put a hat on the defendant. So the suppression court um, suppressed the lineup as to the two witnesses who had mentioned dreadlocks in their description of the perpetrator, but did not suppress the lineup as to the two witnesses who never mentioned hairstyle or dreadlocks. So the issue was really squarely presented as a black and white issue, whether or not the inclusion or omission of a feature in which the ID procedure is allegedly suggestive in the witness's description is necessary to a finding of suggestiveness. And the Court of Appeals um, held that while it was certainly relevant to consider whether or not a witness included, it, included that feature in their description, it was not required or dispositive, and therefore the hearing court had erred, as had the appellate division. The appellate division drew on a long line of cases that were saying this suggestive feature is really insignificant because after all it was not mentioned by the witness in their description. And the Court of Appeals then said, and indeed the lineup was suggestive um, because the defendant stood out in um, that feature of dreadlocks and it was especially suggestive because all witnesses had been exposed to the defendant wearing dreadlocks in the photo array in which they all wore dreadlocks and then you take him out and then you have that common denominator in the lineup where the defendant alone has dreadlocks. Now the Court of Appeals did not explain its decision the, or the analytic bases for its decision. It simply said that we hold that whether or not the witness included the feature in their prior description is simply a factor to consider. But let me suggest to you um, the analytic bases which are very important um, because they can help you litigate the issue of suggestiveness um, in, at the Wade hearing. Oops. Thanks. Um, so first of all, a witness's description simply might not be complete. Then when the officer comes on the scene and says, give me a description of the perpetrator when a witness reports a crime, they may remember to include certain features but not others, and the ones that they don't include didn't necessarily resonate, didn't necessarily register 
perhaps even registered subconsciously, they just didn't think to mention them. Or perhaps the officer didn't write them down. Or perhaps the officer's um, notes are inaccurate. So when you have a police officer testifying to the description at the Wade hearing, that description is not necessarily the entirety of what features registered with um, in, the, in the witness's mind and their memory upon viewing the perpetrator. So that's one reason why the mere fact that a witness didn't mention something is not necessarily relevant. If, if for example, at a lineup, a defendant has protruding ears, the witness might have given height, weight, race, age, facial features and didn't mention the protruding ears, but upon seeing the defendant, and if the defendant is the only one with protruding ears, that might indeed be significantly suggestive. So that's one thing, is that the witness's description is simply not always complete. Um, the other factor is that when you're looking at suggestiveness, you're looking at not only what is suggestive in correspondence to the witness's memory or description, but you're also looking at anything that is signaling to the witness, a signal from the police officers, pick this guy, whether or not it has anything to do with the witness's memory. Think of it as if a witness, you know, if the curtain opens and there's a lineup and there's a neon arrow over the defendant saying, choose me, we presumably would all agree that that's a suggestive feature of a lineup, per perhaps unduly suggestive, and in and of itself should render the lineup suppressible. Now that has nothing to do with the witness's description, but it is a signal to the witness to select the defendant. So in that regard, um, there are features of identification procedures that can be suggestive or unduly suggestive that have nothing to do with the description. Now think of this example, since presumably there's no neon light saying pick me, but there's other ways to accomplish that same result. If there's a lineup of six people and five of them are wearing crisp white shirts and the defendant is wearing a bright red shirt, Let's say, hypothetical number one, the witness never described the color shirt that the perpetrator was wearing. You still have a situation where the defendant being the only one wearing a bright red shirt and everyone else wearing crisp white shirts, that's sort of the functional equivalent of the arrow, pick me. And that would be a suggestive feature of the lineup. Perhaps enough to invalidate the lineup, depends on a lot of other things, but a pretty strong case for it. What if the witness's description of the perpetrator's shirt was that it was a black shirt? I don't think that would make a difference because the defendant is still the person whose image is jumping out at the complainant or the identifying witness as the one to pick as opposed to everyone else who's in nice crisp white shirts. Now if the witness had described a red shirt, we get our maximum suggestiveness because then you also get beyond unnecessarily suggestive, with, especially if the cops knew that there was a description of a red shirt, having the defendant alone wearing the red shirt is simply inexcusable. So um, you can see in those cases that the relevance of the witness's inclusion of red shirt is not necessarily going to dictate the fairness or the validity of the lineup. Now what if the defendant were wearing a red shirt and everyone else is wearing a different color. This filler is wearing yellow, this one is wearing red, I'm sorry, green, purple, orange, blue, and the defendant alone is wearing a red shirt among multicolored shirts. Then it seems to me you have no argument as to suggestiveness, because the defendant, you know, his red shirt is no different than the uh, filler's yellow shirt. But there, if the witness said red shirt, then you have an argument, then the fact that the defendant is the only one who correspondence, corresponds to this feature that the witness bothered to mention is a suggestive feature. So now we see that description can in fact enhance the suggestiveness of an identification procedure. It can it will not be dispositive, but there are many ways in which a feature can jump out irrespective of a witness's description. What um, are the consequences for you as litigants? First and foremost, 
you must be completely familiar with the descriptions given by witnesses to the officers prior to the or to the prosecutor prior to the identification procedure. And I mean the descriptions not just given by the witness who is making the identification, but the eyewitnesses. For example, as we saw in Perkins itself, when witnesses three and four go to the lineup and they didn't mention dreadlocks, ultimately in the Court of Appeals, that lineup was unduly suggestive because other, in part because other witnesses had mentioned dreadlocks, so the cops knew that um, this was a correspondence. The defendant was being singled out by being the only one who met the description. So um, it's important to know what information did the police have prior to arranging the identification procedure that may make their failure to take precautionary measures to reduce that suggestiveness all the more inexcusable. <clears throat> and the other thing to consider is remember the dual aspects of <clears throat> suggestiveness. And this is again where descriptions are important. When you're looking at an array or a lineup, you're looking at not only how closely do the fillers resemble the defendant, but also how closely the fillers resemble the description of the perpetrator. Think about this in a very simple way. If the perpetrator is described as five foot six, and the defendant is five foot eight, and every filler is five foot 10, if you're only looking at if you're only looking at the fillers vis-a-vis -vis the defendant, you could say, oh, well, they're two inches taller than the defendant. That's no big deal. But if you're also looking at them vis-a-vis -vis the description, every filler is four inches taller than the alleged perpetrator. And a five foot six person looks different than a five foot 10 person. So you have to know your descriptions, you have to use them in evaluating the suggestiveness, and you have to consider them vis-a-vis -vis not just the defendant, but also the fillers. Um, I just, just partly for laughs, I do want to mention the one post-Perkins case that I happened to find um, was a case in which the first department about a week and a half ago, said that the defendant's argument that the photo array was suggestive because the defendant was the only one in the photo who was looking straight at the camera and his photo was bigger than the others was unpreserved and we declined to reach it in the interest of justice. And I quote, moreover, although suggestiveness does not turn solely on this factor under Perkins, we note that the alleged deficiencies in the photo array had nothing to do with the description that had been provided by the identifying witness. And when I was reading that, I was saying, I'm sorry, what are they expecting? Officer, officer, I've just been robbed. He's five foot 10, he's you know, about 20 years old, and when you show me the photo array, his photo is gonna be the biggest one that you show me, and he'll be the only one facing the camera. I don't understand what the appellate division was thinking and even mentioning the fact that the witness did not mention in their description the features in which this photograph in the array were allegedly suggestive. But I think, I think that Perkins will hopefully percolate in the lower courts with your help and in the appellate divisions in a more meaningful way and reducing this inexorable link between did the witness mention it in their description? If not, it's not suggestive. Okay, turning to the legislation. <clears throat> um, this major piece of legislation amended CPL 6025, 6030, 71020, 71030, equivalencies in the Family Court Act and the executive law. And there are two things that the legislation in the area of ID accomplished. One, the, the biggie was to render f identifications made from photographic, from photo arrays admissible, changing a long-standing New York common law. And two, mandating protocols um, on 
how identification procedures, not just photo arrays, but identification procedures are to be conducted and mandating training by, of police officers in these protocols. Okay, so as far as the admissibility of photographic identifications, as you know, New York was one of the last holdouts, if not the last holdouts, prohibiting evidence of an identification made from photo arrays at trial, on, largely on the theory that that would signal to the jury that the defendant was known to the police by virtue of the photo being included in um, a photo, either a, a computer photo array or a photo spread. Um, it was the rogues gallery argument. So <clears throat> now that that's been legislatively overruled, here's what's admissible. Evidence of an identification by a witness of a pictorial, photographic, electronic, filmed, or video recorded reproduction of the defendant. It is admissible only if the procedure was conducted in a blind or blinded fashion. What is blind? Blind means that the administrator, meaning the cop, who, or I guess it could be a prosecutor, um, who is conducting the procedure with the identifying witness, does not know who the suspect is. Blinded means the administrator doesn't know where in the procedure the defendant is, um, what, like what number in the array or where the defendant is. If the procedure, the photographic procedure, is neither blind nor blinded, it is inadmissible. However, the fact that it is inadmissible for failure to be conducted in a blind or blinded fashion does not equate with it being constitutionally suppressible. It's not a legal basis for suppression, and I will get to what that means as a practical matter. So, a couple of preliminary questions that this legislation may raise in your minds. In terms of identification procedures covered, when they mention pictorial, photographic, electronic, filmed, and video, what about composite sketches? New York has a rule against the admission of composite sketches or IDs based on, um, based on the viewing of a composite sketch. I think that this legislation doesn't alter that prohibition because that prohibition is also anchored on some hearsay concerns. Um, that the person who is drawing the, the composite sketch artist is drawing this information from descriptions supplied by other sources or maybe information from other sources. And so there's some anchor in the hearsay prohibition and I don't think that this is, this legislation is designed to change that or at least that will be, um, that will remain to be seen. Second, what practically is the requirement of blind or blinded and why? The requirements of having blind identification procedures is really based on a scientific method of research. It is an established protocol in any scientific research that's going to be legitimately validated that that be a blind experiment. And the reason is twofold. One, that um, if the person conducting the experiment has, knows the outcome that they, or has a certain desire for an outcome, there's the risk of experimenter bias, where somehow, consciously or otherwise, they will skew the results and they will get results that justify their premise or are consistent with their information. The other thing, and this is particularly relevant in the area of identification is this notion of experiment or expectancy effect and the relationship with the subject. Um, so in the um, ID area, there's a concern that when a police officer or a detective or prosecutor develops a relationship with a witness, the witness comes into the identification procedure sort of, again, could be on, not even on a conscious level, wanting to satisfy um, the person with whom they've developed a relationship so that you have this notion that they're gonna come in 
and want to perform correctly, want to give the right answer, want to give the right result, which leads to an increased likelihood that they will make an identification if they think that that's what the experimenter or administrator wants them to do and you know, be a good little doobie and, and um, perform accordingly. So having administrators conduct experiments who have seemingly no vested interest in the outcome or certainly don't have the knowledge as to what the outcome should be, theoretically guards against some of these experimenter bias and expectancy effect. So certainly that's true when a procedure is blind. But what about when a procedure is blinded? So they talk about blinded is you know good enough as long as the administrator doesn't know what um, position the defendant is in the, uh, in the array. Now, if you're doing computer stuff, which I know in New York City is pretty much the way business is done, where the, the police officer may input certain identifying data, and then photos start getting generated a certain number of page, and the witness is sitting there looking at screen after screen, well, clearly, those are, by definition, blinded. Um, but if you're talking about an array, the only or a lineup, it seems to me that while the, if the cop knows who the suspect is and now it has to be blinded, that would mean, I think, someone else has to sort of shuffle the photos, put it in a closed folder, give it to the witness, and I, the one who knows which one is the defendant and the suspect, I have to not look while I hand this to the witness and they open it and I can't see, because the minute I see the array, I know I'm now no longer conducting a blinded procedure because now I not only know who the suspect is, but I know which number they are in the array. So um, there has to be some way to ensure that that remain blinded, which means either I stand away from this, I don't see it, or it might just be easier to have a blind procedure in those circumstances. So these are some of the nuances that are going to ultimately be litigated in terms of what does it mean to have a truly blinded procedure. As I said, I think in the computer procedure, it's going to be blinded automatically. But when you're talking about finite photo arrays or finite lineups, it becomes more problematic to have it on the one hand, not be blind, but yet still be blinded. Um, also, there's just a question for what it's worth. Does blinded adequately address the scientific research concerns? Because you still have, once you have the administrator know who the suspect is, even if they don't know who the array is, they're kind of there and lurking, and there's still some of that concern that, um, you know, there's, there's more of a vested interest being communicated to the witness. If not, who to pick out, certainly that they should pick out somebody. So um, I think it's questionable whether or not uh, blinded really addresses these concerns. And I would note that in the protocols that have been developed under the executive law, there is a clear stated preference for a blind procedure whenever possible, rather than a blinded procedure. Now, what happens if they don't do it blind or blinded, or the blinded isn't truly blinded? There's an explicit remedy created in CPL 6025, which is failure to administer the procedure blind or blinded, quote, shall result in the preclusion of testimony regarding the identification procedure as evidence in chief. And then it goes on to say, but shall not constitute a legal basis to suppress, which I will get to. So it's interesting that they put the explicit remedy in 6025. To refresh your recollection, 6025 applies only when the witness is unable to identify the defendant in court and you're looking to use third-party testimony. In other words, witness identified the defendant prior to trial. Witness comes into court. DA says, do you see the person who robbed you? Uh, I'm not sure. And once it is established that, one, it's not an unwillingness to make an in-court identification, it's an inability to make an in-court identification, 
based on passage of time or the defendant's changed appearance. And two, the witness can say, but I'm certain that the person who I identified in the lineup is the person who robbed me. Then you can have third party testimony, usually the cops say, the person they identified in the lineup is in fact the defendant sitting there. What 6025 does is basically create an exception to the Trowbridge rule that would otherwise prohibit a third party from coming in and testifying to a witness's out of court ID. And it does it basically linking everything together in a, in a pyramid. I, the victim, identified the perpetrator in the lineup. I'm certain that that was the perpetrator. I can't identify the defendant in court. And the witness says, and then the, cop, the third party comes in and makes that link, okay? What they're saying in 6025 is now, obviously, it doesn't only have to have been, it, it can have been a lineup pretrial, but it also could have been a photo. So if the witness identified the defendant in photo and can't identify the defendant in court, under the new legislation, the police officer can come in and say, the person they identified in the photo is the defendant, but not if it's blind. So 6025 simply says, by the way, the prior, the pretrial identification that can be admitted through a third party can now be any, you know, can now be through, uh, it could be a photo ID as well as a lineup or any other ID. And if it's not blind or blinded, however, it doesn't come in. So what does that mean? That means if the witness can't identify the defendant and the only pretrial ID was a photo and the people have no other ID, the case is dismissed, okay? Um, but that was always true, um, that if there was no pretrial ID that was admissible, then 6025 um, wouldn't apply. So, the only other remedy section, um, now under 6030, which is the one that allows a witness to testify to their own prior ID, obviously also an exception to the hearsay rule, um, but 6030 is the one that even if you don't know it by name, allows witnesses to consistently come into court and recite their pretrial show up ID or their pretrial lineup ID. And now under the legislation, it also includes their pretrial photo ID. But again, the photo ID has to be blinded. Um, now what's interesting is 6030 doesn't contain a remedy clause. It doesn't say, in, in 6025, which now says the prior ID can be a photo ID, but if it's not blind or blinded, it is not admissible. 6030 doesn't contain a remedy clause. But it is clear um, because it references 6025. So it is clear, oh, at least under Miriam's reading of the legislation, but I think it's pr pretty clear to others, that here's the bottom line. Pre-trial identifications from photos, films, pictures, whatever, are admissible if blind or blinded, either under 6025 when the witness can't make an in-court ID and the other foundational requirements of 6025 are met, or under 6030. If it's not blind or blinded, then nobody can testify to it. Not the witness herself under 6030 and not the third party under 6025. Now both of the, whenever they reference 71020 or 6025, when they reference the remedy, they say it's inadmissible if not blind or blinded, but this doesn't constitute a legal basis for suppression. So what does that mean? Because that is significant. Under 71020, it says not only that if a photo ID isn't blind or blinded, that shall not constitute a legal basis for suppression, but it also says, and by the way, if any ID doesn't comport with all these protocols that we've now ordered be put into place, the failure to comply with those protocols under the executive law mandate also is not a legal basis for suppression. So what does that mean? What that means is a suppression claim under 71020 
only lies when you have a constitutional challenge to the admissibility of the identification. It violated the right to counsel, an unlawful search and seizure, or due process under unnecessary suggestiveness. There are many bases to preclude identifications that are non-constitutional and don't come under 71020. For example, a failure to serve notice, um, statutory violations, evidentiary violations. None of those are constitutional objections to the identification. So what it seems to me the legislature is saying is that the mere fact that a procedure, photo, lineup, or whatever, is not conducted in a blind or blinded fashion with regard to photos or lineups, or that the procedure doesn't follow the protocols that we're now setting out and requiring officers be trained on, that in and of itself does not constitute a constitutional basis for suppression. However, and this is a big caveat, the legislature also says, however, this shall neither expand nor limit the rights of an accused person as they may derive under the Constitution. What that says to me is it doesn't mean that you can't use <clears throat> these protocols on how identification procedures should be conducted and how cops are supposed to be uh, trained now on how they should properly be conducted. It doesn't mean that though that failure to follow those protocols are irrelevant to a constitutional claim. In other words, that before this legislation ever came into effect, courts were looking at things like were cautionary instructions given to the witness? Did um, the fillers adequately match the description or the defendant? Even things like blind, a couple of courts were looking at whether a procedure was blind or blinded, and it all went into the hopper in analyzing whether or not a procedure was unduly suggestive. So all that is to say that you definitely want to look at these protocols and say, here's a legislative mandate developed by all the parties, the police and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys for guidelines on how to best conduct an identification procedure to reduce its suggestiveness. And if every one of those, those protocols are ignored, at some point that can add up um, or some of them can factor into a suggestiveness claim. So don't assume that blind or blinded is per se irrelevant to a suggestion in this claim. It's just that it doesn't equal a constitutional basis for suppression. Now, what's the difference between saying the fact that a procedure was not blind, a photo ID procedure was not blind or blinded means it's precluded versus it's suppressed? Well, one difference is um, your independent source and taint analysis. If, let's say, there was a case where there was a photo ID followed by a lineup, and the photo ID was not blind or blinded. That photo ID is inadmissible because the legislative quid pro quo in allowing photo IDs into evidence is that they can only come in if they're blind or blinded. So that photo ID is out. But that's not a constitutional claim in and of itself. That means it doesn't necessarily trigger your taint analysis requiring independent source or attenuation for the lineup. That would be required if the photo ID is itself unduly suggestive or violated the right to counsel or violated un, uh, unlawful search and seizure in the use of the photo. So what they're saying is, is that that's just a per se rule of exclusion. In order for you to get into independent source analysis and taint, you have to have a constitutional claim. And then you have this presumptive taint, and the taint has to be attenuated. Of course, you can always challenge the lineup as itself unduly suggestive, um, whether it was tainted by the pretrial ID or not. So that's one significance between saying the unblind, blinded photo ID is precluded versus it's not legally suppressible. Um, Okay, so what are some of the practical consequences of this legislation for you, the practitioners? One, notice. 
prosecution's notice requirement. Um, lest there be any doubt remaining from um, Grahalis, I think it's pretty clear that you have to specify the photo ID in your notice requirement. And I think that's true whether or not it's you intend to offer it. Um, Grahalis was a very strange case where in that case the prosecution served notice of one ID but not the pretrial photo ID. And the Court of Appeals had said the prosecution doesn't have to serve notice of the pretrial photo ID because they could not have intended to offer it so they didn't have to specify it in the ID notice and the reason they could not have intended to offer it is at the time photo IDs were not admissible. But Grahalis has subsequently been interpreted by both lower court and um, a number of appellate divisions as not being a no notice case because in fact the prosecutor had served notice of their intention to offer identification testimony by a witness who had previously identified the defendant. And then you also have the case which I talked about I believe last year, Marshall, which overruled the trial preparation exception to the notice, saying that a prosecutor is showing a witness in preparation of trial some photos of the lineup or saying, remember when you view this, I'm going to ask you about the lineup. Even though it was trial preparation, the Court of Appeals said we're overruling our trial preparation exception to the notice requirement and the prosecution has to serve notice of any confrontation that they have with the witness and photos pretty much whether they intend to elicit that photo confrontation or not. And one lower court fairly recently said, in light of Marshall, it is clear that, and I quote, that the people have an obligation to advise the defendant of all per police arranged viewings of the defendant's photo by a, ten by a potential trial witness. It does not matter whether the people can admit or intend to admit the photo at trial. So, on balance, I think it's pretty clear that the notice obligation is to specify the photo ID, whether or not you ultimately think, you the prosec prosecutor ultimately think it will be admissible because it wasn't blind or blinded. The other thing is that the parties have to familiarize themselves with these protocols because they become absolutely essential to litigating suggestiveness at the Wade hearing. And I think that these protocols will also impact on the prosecution's burden of proof under Holly. Holly was a case I also talked about last year, which, which now made clear that if the prosecution doesn't preserve the array or the photo of the lineup, there's a presumption of suggestiveness. However, Holly said that the prosecution can overcome that presumption by having the cop give, quote, testimonial equivalent as to, you know, what the photos generally look like. But the Court of Appeals did recognize that the prosecutor's obligation might be enhanced the more that the defense can show that they could have reproduced the array or that there was negligence involved or whatever. Um, so it seems to me now that you have these protocols that say everything from ID procedures should be video, should be recorded both through forms and audio, um, if not video, and other protocols that police officers are now being trained on, it makes it a lot easier for defense attorney to cross-examine and then use this information and say, but the protocols say they should have done this, 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 they didn't do it, and certainly in a case where there's a presumption of suggestiveness, I think the prosecution would be hard-pressed to overcome that. Um, okay, another thing is what type of jury instructions should we be thinking about? One of the main concerns about the um, admis admission of identifications from photographs was that jurors would assume that the defendant has a criminal record because his photograph is being generated in a police computer or whatever. So. It's going to be up to you guys to think about what type, of, what type of jury instructions might address or ameliorate that concern and um, be creative about fashioning them. The last question I kind of throw it out because I've discussed this with colleagues is, are lineups going to be a thing of the past? You know, 
or if photographic identifications are admissible, will the police have any incentive to conduct lineups and what type of arguments can be made, especially by defense counsel, if you're going into a trial where the only thing that happened was an ID from a photo array, and then of course the witness is likely to pick the guy sitting at the defense counsel. Is there any room to make arguments that the absence of a lineup um, somehow minimizes the impact of that array, um, of that photo ID? I just want to um, give you some idea of the protocols. I'm just going to take a minute and run through some of them. The protocols that have been promulgated under the executive law mandate, it was issued by the Criminal Justice, Division of Criminal Justice Services and Municipal Police, Police Training Council. It governs how they should select fillers, the number, the suspects per array, the quality of photos, the defendant picking his position in the lineup, um, what I talked about before, it talks about evaluating the fillers vis-a-vis -vis the description as well as vis-a-vis -vis the defendant. There are protocols governing how they invite the witness down to the precinct to view anything and what they should say and what they should not say. Um, it involves instructions to the witness at the identification procedure. They even have written instructions that, and that the police officer is supposed to read including cautionary instructions, and one of the big cautionary instructions I want to mention is telling the witness that the perpetrator may or may not be included in this photo array that you're about to see, or may or may not be in this lineup. And the reason that that is a critical cautionary instruction is that it reduces, theoretically, the expectation that a witness has that the suspect is there and they should perform well by picking someone out. Because while it may not signal pick out the defendant, it is, has been documented to, um, that it increases the inclination of the witness to make an identification and then they'll make a relative judgment from the people they see who most resembles the defendant, uh, the perpetrator in my mind. And that cautionary instruction was so significant in the scientific research backing it that many, many moons ago, Janet Reno's Justice Department issued requirements that those cautionary instructions be given in every federal ID procedure. So that's significant. Um, there's uh, protocols governing the audio and video re recording of the procedure. Um, the witness's consent is required. There, is protocol, there are protocols governing how to administer the procedure with multiple witnesses, where the cop should be sitting. He can't be making eye contact or you know, signaling to the witness. Um, Post-viewing questions and instructions that are required, including forms uh, that the officer is supposed to fill out, documenting the witness's level of certainty at the time of the procedure, any uh, things that you, the officer can say to the witness afterwards, specifically nothing like, thank God you made an ID, you picked the right guy because he already confessed, because they found that while that, that doesn't necessarily render suggestive the ID that's already happened, it actually has, one, a potential effect on their making a subsequent pretrial ID, but even um, science has shown that in describing the ID at the time of trial, the witness will have a much more enhanced confidence in their ID from what they call this post-event reinforcement. Um, so there are protocols pretty much governing every phase of the ID procedure. There are forms, um, and so it should be interesting how this stuff starts getting litigated at the Wade hearing and how it affects the party's respective obligations. Thank you very much. Are any, any questions? There's a, there's a question in the back. Hi, my question is where do we find those protocols? DC, DCJS uh, online, you can go to DCJS, they're online. Thank you very much.